Well, um, welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our webinar, Get Into uh, WIPO. We are delighted to have you uh, here. Um, I see people are still connecting, that's great. Um, so first, um, let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Camille Francoise and I'm working for IFRA, um, the International Federation of Library Association and Institution. And today we, we have this discussion with um, Stephen Viber, also working for IFRA. And we have two additional speakers, um, Teresa Hackett from Electronic Information for Libraries that you can see in the panel, and also Nicola Varter from Education International. And we, um, just so you know, um, you have the possibility to have the uh, English subtitling um, normally appearing on your screen. And you can also on the top left of your screen, you will have access to a translation via our uh, worldly tool. So you can pick a language that might be easier if you find it more comfortable to have a better understanding of the discussion. Um, and so we are delighted to start this discussion and I will share my screen. Yeah. Oh. A second. I think it's this one. I think it works well now. And I will uh, turn to my colleague, uh, Stefan Weiber, to start. So thank you, Camille, and, and welcome everyone to this webinar. So uh, as you can see in the, in the title page, this is a, a talk about the work of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And if we go to the next slide, um, when we talk about the work of WIPO, we're talking about copyright. And in fact, the work of IFLA and its partners at WIPO is a really crucial part of our broader agenda on copyright. Now, of course, copyright isn't always the most exciting subject. It often appears to be quite technical. It's a subject that's often difficult for libraries. We worry that it's a case of us being against authors and against others. However, I want to argue, and, and it's the argument that we make throughout here, that we have a really important stake in getting it right. And our argument will be that working with WIPO is a great way of doing this. So if we move to the next slide, I'm sure that a lot of people on this call are familiar with copyright already, but just to give you a, a primer on, on what it means. So copyright is, it's an idea, it's been created, implemented by governments in order to give rights holders. So authors, musicians, but very often actually the companies that buy and trade their rights, control over how works are distributed, copied or used. It means that effectively they can choose who buys a work, they can set a price, and they can control how it's used, they can prevent it being shared freely and openly in order to be able to make money off it. Now this is a right that lasts for a very long time, um, far longer than is economically justified, arguably. In, and under international law already, it's the life of the author plus another 50 years. So for example, under international law, works that are becoming available now, copyright protection applies to all works by people who died after 1950. So this is a long time. We're talking about a, a really long lasting right. It's also a right that applies internationally. So in the country you're in, the government is supposed to give the same protection to work by authors, by publishers from other countries as they do from your country. Now, this is, as I said, a very extensive power, a very long lasting power, and it would have the potential to really limit what libraries can do in order to use works, to give access to works, to allow users to get the best out of works in order to achieve their goals, education, research, and so on. Fortunately, there's the concept of exceptions and limitations to copyright. These are provisions that allow you to carry out certain uses, for example, lending or preservation or research copying without having to ask for permission every time, without having to pay money every time. Because if you think if libraries had to do this, Every time you wanted to let someone copy a work for personal research, every time you wanted to lend a work, 
every time you wanted to preserve a work, you had to find someone, often many people, and get permissions. This just wouldn't work. Um, however, exceptions and limitations don't apply across borders. They are incredibly uneven across countries. Some countries have a very extensive set, a very flexible set of exceptions. Others have none at all. And so we have this challenge that we have this incredibly important issue for libraries, but one where in a lot of cases, members, our members don't benefit from it, where library users in some countries have many more possibilities than others. If we can go to the next slide. So to put all of this text in, in brief, um, effectively we should be seeing copyright laws and getting the right copyright laws for libraries as one and the same thing as getting adequate funding for libraries because for all that we benefit from proper support from governments from institutions from others if we're not then allowed to use works effectively this money goes to waste however on the other hand if there is relatively less money available a decent set of copyright laws will enable libraries to have an impact so that's the overall framework this is why copyright matters it's all about libraries having an impact with the resources that they have being able to fulfill their missions and what we do at WIPO is part of doing this so I'm now going to hand back to Camille who will give you a little bit more background about what WIPO is itself as further context Thanks a lot. Um, so what is WIPO and why is it a key area for library advocacy? What is WIPO? Um, so WIPO is a world intellectual property organization. Um, and this is a United Nations agency with uh, 191 member states. And uh, what I think it's important to understand is the key role that WIPO has as a forum for adoption of global uh, legal instrument on intellectual property. Um, and also for its ability to uh, launch discussion about laws and practice and their impact um, for, and for the international intellectual property services. WIPO has different area of, of focus. Uh, it goes from the patents to trademarks, including uh, also industrial design, geographical indication, and traditional knowledge. But for us as libraries, and for in general also um, educational and research and archive and museums as well, like for us, what what's really matters within the WIPO work is copyright, and that's the as my colleague mentioned already, the key, the key area where we are working. I think um, we, what, what, what we have to also see uh, within the WIPO work is actually the, the fact that WIPO works through consensus. So it means that to be able to move forward discussion and actions, um, we need to have the member representative um, uh, within WIPO to agree and to find a consensus. So therefore, it's it's taking some time, time and efforts to manage to gather um, um, a perspective to actually get to that to that point. So it can be it can be. Um, it can take some time to to reach out to a consensus, obviously. So how does it work? Um, the WIPO has different uh, meetings um, on the different areas that I've mentioned earlier, and I will focus on the one which is uh, on, which is on specifically on copyright. And this this special meeting is a standing committee on copyright and related rights that we also call SCCR. This uh, meeting is, uh, this committee is meeting um, biannually, so twice a year, um, with country representatives. Um, in general, it goes, the first meeting would be, the, the first meeting of the committee would be um, around April, May to um, May, June or July, and the second meeting would be in October, November, December. And every year it depends, the dates are, are flexible. So every year we are waiting for the calendar of WIPO to, to let us know when the meeting will occur. Um, so this is one of the, it, this is the committee where the WIPO, the copyright work is, is being done. Um, 
Another key aspect is also to understand who is coming to, to this uh, uh, committee, to this meeting. Um, so um, we have on one side the Geneva-based delegates. So it includes um, diplomats or uh, second and official. Um, in their title, you can, it's, it's, it, you can see that it's um, uh, first secretary, second secretary, third, third secretary that are uh, joining this meeting. So those are the Geneva-based delegates. They are in Geneva all year long, and they are generally um, uh, focusing on additional uh, area, um, not only on copyright, obviously. And we have the capital delegates. Um, those are officials from the uh, intellectual property offices uh, in in their uh, home lands. Um, the intellectual property office is uh, the office which is also including copyrights uh, and so we are working uh, very closely with them. Um, I would say that indeed like, what we have to understand how uh, what can be the advantage of WIPO and of the SCCR, so the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, is their ability to produce research and guidance, and, and also in international instruments. And therefore, that's the reason why we're engaging as well, because we want to move things forward and we want to make progress on copyright issues in, within libraries, but also because they have the capacity to undertake uh, those research and, and, and provide guidance for member states, um, which are very obviously uh, really interesting for us. Um, apart from the research and guidance, they, have, they are also able to carry out uh, work to support capacity building in, 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 in different countries or in, in, on the regional scale, for instance. Um, to continue on how WIPO is working, uh, how, how does it work? Um, I think we also need to go through the different um, the organization of member states uh, within within WIPO. Uh, so we have different groups. Um, on one side we have uh, Africa group. On the other side we have Latin America and Caribbean that we also know under the name uh, Gruyac. We have Group B, which is uh, which encompasses um, industrial countries and including subgroups like the European Union, Asia Pacific, Central Central Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Caucasus that we also name CASEC, Central Europe and the Baltic states that we call SEPs, and China, which is on its own. To continue. Um, us as IFA, EFL, and Education International, we are part of the, the observer group. So it means that we are able to, um, to be part of the conversation um, and to make declaration after the discussion among member states. And we are also able to uh, provide indeed feedback and our perspective on our key area of expertise. So I divided into several groups. So we have IFRIAS, obviously, and the library IIs, which includes uh, electronic information for libraries, EFL with Teresa Aket in the webinar, the African Library and Information Association and Institution AFRIA. But we also have uh, global IIs that are supporting uh, common goals uh, from IFRIA perspective, which includes, obviously, Education International in this call, but also Wikimedia, Communia, Charisma, Knowledge Ecology International, PGIP. Um, it's also encompassed as well um, ICAS, the International Council of Archive, uh, International Council of Museum, ICOM, Creative Commons, and other stakeholders that are aiming for, for um, sharing knowledge and information. And, and so we, we are working closely with them. Another group is uh, the, inter the um, we can see below, it's the International uh, Publisher Association, International Federation of Reprographic Repro Rights Organization, uh, International Authors Federation, etc., etc. Uh, the list is way broader than this, but I just made it like, a, a little bit shorter. Um, and so now I will hand over uh, to uh, my colleague Stephen to continue on why does engaging in WIPO helps libraries. Thanks.
thank you very much. So you've now got an idea of, of roughly what WIPO looks like, what, what, what WIPO does. And as I said at the beginning, WIPO is a, a major part of our work on copyright as an organization. So what I, I hope to do in this next section is set out clearly why this is the case, why we invest, despite the fact that it may be slow, it may be bureaucratic. So can we go to the next slide? Um, so I think crucially in this, we have to recognize that WIPO is unique among international organizations here. It is the only in global organization that allows properly for participation by observers, by stakeholders like ourselves, like education, like research, like archives, like museums, that opens up this possibility to try and make laws at the global level. Um, and partly, of course, this is necessary because one of the challenges we have today is the fact that laws are not global. Laws are made up nationally, which means that, for example, if libraries want to work together on a preservation project, if they want to work together in order to support cross-border research, even if they want to make items from their collection available digitally worldwide, they face uncertainty. Because while it may be legal in your country, it may not be legal elsewhere. Um, and so WIPO is the one organization where you can do this at this global level, where a single action at WIPO will have this really huge impact, this really huge reach. And as said at the beginning, there is this really pressing need for our institutions to be able to do this, to make sure that all of our users, all library users in all countries benefit from this basic set of exceptions and limitations. A second key reason is that WIPO isn't just about working committees, a lot of its time, a lot of it eff its effort goes on building capacity within governments around others in, and among others around the world. This is, we don't see so much of this. A lot of this carried, is carried out at a relatively low level, but it's really influential. If WIPO tells a government to do something, they will tend to listen. And so this is, again, it, we engage because we know that if we engage, if we can influence what WIPO is doing, then that will hopefully influence what governments are doing. We also engage because there's something special about international meetings. It's a lot easier to meet with copyright officials. If you try to meet with copyright officials in government, you will often have to set up a time for a meeting. You'll have to go through a number of different officials in order to meet the head woman, the head man. But at WIPO, there is this great possibility just to walk up to them, at least in pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID times as well, where you can actually talk to them. You can actually have an influence. And all of these things together mean that WIPO becomes an interesting place, an interesting proposal, if we want to work in favour of better laws and frameworks and copyright for libraries. So to provide a little bit more detail, let's go on to the next slide. Just to give you an idea of, of the challenge we're facing. Now, the first point, as echoed, is that we do have a huge problem with the inadequacy of copyright laws. To take just one example, only 30% of countries have exceptions that allow for digital preservation. And often these are in countries which are richer. Countries which tend to be less well off often have poorer exceptions and limitations, which means that their libraries, you, are less able to carry out preservation activities. The same goes for research, for education. So we're in this bizarre situation where it's students, researchers, citizens of richer countries who have better access to possibilities to learn more, to develop more, to become richer. Um, a second issue is that action at the national level will never solve the problem of cross-border working. There needs to be action at the international level to give libraries, to give others the confidence necessary to be able to work across borders without worrying about whether they may be breaking the law. And finally here, well, Copyright is clearly extremely important for libraries. It's important for many of us. This is not necessarily the case that it's going to be the number one possibility for the number one priority for governments. No government wins or loses an election because of its copyright policy. We understand, in, of course, in a lot of countries, there are many pressing priorities, education, health, economy, employment. So what's helpful here is that for governments in that situation, it can be really powerful to have WIPO saying, it would be good to do this. You should do this, you should sign up to the treaty. And we've seen this with the Marrakesh Treaty, which I'll mention later. 
WIPO acting has an incredible power to trigger change at the national level. So next slide, please. Talking then again about the Marrakesh Treaty, clearly this, this has been done before. WIPO has shown its ability to take international action, to facilitate the work of libraries, to make it easier for libraries to serve their users. Now the Marrakesh Treaty focused specifically on the question of getting rid of copy or unnecessary copyright barriers to making and sharing accessible format copies of works. This means book works, books in braille, in daisy format that allow people with print disabilities to access them. However, this is only part of a wider agenda. It's supposed to be the first pillar. Then this is the same work stream that also included libraries, archives, and museums and education and research. So, WIPO has shown what it can do. It's shown how it can make a difference. It's shown how it can deliver more equitable access and use possibilities. So it's unfinished business. There's work to do still. Then the next slide. Linked to this is arguably the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequences often linked to the ne measures necessarily taken by governments has been to really underline the case that we need more modern copyright laws. Governments need to have the guidance and the support in order to modernize their laws. Because a lot of the time we've seen that the sorts of activities that libraries can carry out within their walls without having to worry, story times, personal copying in many cases, a lot of these things simply haven't been possible online or have been made subject to new restrictions have been made subject to the necessity to seek guidance, to seek permission from others. And this removes, the, this means that libraries aren't able to do all in the digital world that they can in the physical world. Now, this is clearly something that a lot of us, everyone has experienced recently. But of course, in doing this, in not being able to go to the library physically, to use books on site, to make copies on site, so many more people have realized what it's like to be someone with a disability, someone who lives in a remote area, someone without resources, someone who also can't visit a library particularly easily and is still not going to be able to visit it particularly easily once lockdown restrictions lifted. And so updating laws, making sure that libraries in every country can carry out their missions digitally, is something that is going to be necessary. It's going to be very vital into the future and it's somewhere where WIPO can help. Of course, for governments themselves, not all of them have a huge capacity on copyright. This is a relatively technical area and whereas some governments may have whole teams of people working on copyright, they may have legal advisors, a lot of them simply won't. And so governments themselves need this guidance, they can benefit from the steer, from the direction that WIPO can provide in order to know that it's okay to facilitate distance learning, it's okay to facilitate e-lending, it's okay to support access to research during a pandemic and beyond. Their, their, their worries are not unfounded. We do see complaints such as the section, special section 301 report in the United States and efforts increasingly from the European Union to try and attack governments for not having sufficient uh, adequate copyright policies. And so this is a justifiable fear. There's a really, really good real value in WIPO being able to come forward and say, no, it's okay to facilitate the work of libraries, archives, museums, education and research right now. You can do it, you don't need to be worried. So next slide. So those arguments have been relatively high level, relatively theoretical, but there are some more practical benefits that come out of this, the practical benefits that come out of working with WIPO for libraries in general. Now, clearly one of them, as mentioned earlier, is that WIPO is active at the national level. It is active in building capacity. And so by working with WIPO, it makes it easier for us to get involved in workshops. To, to provide, to ensure that there are invitations to local librarians to be able to participate. We've seen this in web, work, workshops, for example, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Abu Dhabi recently, well, pre-COVID, obviously. As Camille said, working with WIPO, it allows us to promote and to draw on some really helpful research. And we'll 
including the email we'll send out afterwards, will include a link to the cruise report, which is really the definitive, the go-to source of information about different copyright laws. There's also the fact that when IFLA is able to speak up at WIPO, and when our colleagues, our, our partner organizations are able to speak up at WIPO, we can hope that the people sitting there, the intellectual property office officials, the copyright office officials, they are hearing that libraries are a stakeholder. They are hearing that libraries have a perspective, an interest that they need to be taken into account. And this can be really important because too often copyright discussions are made to look like a fight between Google and major music and film companies. Too often the interests of users, and the interests of libraries are forgotten. So it's really important to be able to be there to make the case for the vision of copyright, of access to knowledge that we have. And of course, in very practical terms, and we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, there's the fact that be having a meeting of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights every six months provides an excuse for you to be in contact with your national copyright offices, to build up relationships, to get to know them, and hopefully then to become part of their consultation circle, to become a regular partner for them so that when your national laws are being reviewed, then your copyright offices know that you're the people to come to, you should be consulted, you should be involved. So that's quite a long list. I think what we'll now do, I'll hand over to Camille to talk about the latest development at WIPO. Thanks a lot. Um, so for the latest development at WIPO, um, I we go to the next slide if it works. Yes, so in, um, in 2019, um, WIPO uh, had organized uh, three regional seminars uh, in order to understand the state of exception and limitation. Um, so we had one in Kenya, one in Santo Domingo, and one in Singapore. Um, we, um, we also had, uh, they also organized a, a conference on exception and limitation for libraries, archive, museum, and educational and research institution. Um, plenty of documents are online and we are we would be delighted to actually share them with you so you would also have our perspective on on those events um, and since COVID-19 has, has delayed progress uh, there is uh, uh, but but um, but because we one of the meeting has been cancelled uh, at uh, last spring and and we have moved of course now online but um, so that's that's one thing, and also I think one of the major events of WIPO recently has been also the um, election of a new uh, director general, which is Darren Tang uh, from the uh, copyright, uh, the uh, intellectual property office uh, of Singapore. So we are we are um, we are also in this uh, we we are also working with this new. Uh, Directorate, so uh, it's um, it's also a, a news because uh, the previous director general has been there for something like I'm going to say something maybe wrong. I think it's 14 years or 12 years, quite a long time. So I think it's a it's a new movement as well, and we are delighted to be able to work with with um, with a new team as well. So so that's a, the it is news. Um, uh, the SCCR 40, so the Standing Committee on Related Rights, um, on Copyright and Related Rights, we, we, we name it um, SCCR 40 because of the 40th meeting. Uh, during this event, we have seen um, several uh, proposals and discussion occurred. And one of them is, uh, as you can see on the slide, a proposal of study on the benefits of public lending rights. Um, this, uh, this proposal has been um, uh, made by Sierra Leone um, and supported by Panama and Mayawi representative. Uh, of course, IFRA and also the CFAA, the Canadian Federation of Library Association, and EFL in this call, we oppose this proposition and because we believe that a reframing would be uh, necessary to integrate um, a broader scope um, um, 
and so we 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 think also that including other means to support creator would be necessary to actually have a more complete uh, scope of the of this uh, study. Um, so this is one of the uh, discussion that occurred at the last meeting. And I think it would be interesting to go a bit more into IFRIA's position at the moment. Uh, so it, we are working um, on several uh, topics. Uh, the first one is preservation plus. So this is, as Stephen already mentioned earlier, the question of um, the capacity of countries to actually make preservation copies um, of work for preservation uh, purposes. So it's the right to preserve heritage, for instance, um, including uh, provision for cross-border. Um, and so the main goal would be to give access to preserved works for education and research purposes as well. Um, so we are working um, on, 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 on this. Um, we are also hoping that in the future, and actually already now, but uh, for the next meeting to move forward on education and research, but my, my colleague from Education International is going to provide a bit more input on, on, on this uh, key topic. We also try to uh, move forward on on making a case to support a COVID-19 declaration. Um, because we have seen, as my colleague uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, that um, libraries and many other um, uh, educational institutions also uh, ha have seen um, issues when it comes to access to information and to knowledge. And we believe that the COVID-19 uh, COVID um, situation has highlighted those, those access issues. Um, and of course, what I've mentioned earlier, the, the opposition to PAR, uh, so public lending rights in developing countries, and, and that we also work on encouraging the more um, honest approach um, on the scope uh, that has been uh, proposed for now. Um, so to start to dig a bit more into those topics, um, as I mentioned, the preservation, um, I mean, we are working currently with um, what we call the YAM group, which includes uh, ICA, the International Council of Archive, ICOM, the International Council of Museums, EFL, um, uh, to, to, to move forward on the preservation uh, uh, discussion. So to allow libraries, archives, and museums to make copies of work for preservation purposes, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we also would like to highlight very, very strongly the need for cross borders provision, um, as I did earlier, and to provide access to those work to uh, for education and research purposes. Um, for us, the, the one of the main lines that we are also supporting is also the, the, the question of, of how the climate change and the, the climate change will impact those uh, works at, uh, in the next, if it's not now, if it's um, uh, in the future, because of course climate change is the um, um, occurring and and we know that works are are, are uh, fragile and that um, for many reasons can be degraded um, and so we need to actually move forward um, on on this preservation aspect without otherwise we might lose um, the opportunity to safeguard safeguard um, this heritage um, so that's one aspect, and of course, um, we would like to. We are. This would be, um, in general, in support of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals A11.4, uh, which is indeed safeguarding heritage and the UNESCO 2015 recommendation on documentary heritage. So we are moving. We are moving forward on those topics. Um, and we hope that we we be able to raise those uh, topics uh, with representative of each countries to move this topic forward in the in the future. And now I will turn to uh, my colleague from from Education International, um, Nicola Warter. We would be delighted to hear you on educational education and research. 
Yes. Ah, there. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> I hope you can hear me. I couldn't find the, the video button, but now I have it. <laughs> so um, I cannot see that there's the presentation somehow. My, there, ah, now I'm back. Great, technological difficulties. Um, yes, I'm very delighted to be um, part of this uh, discussion. I, I'm Nicola Wachter. I'm a teacher by education. I work for Education International, which is the global federation of education unions representing teachers, researchers, and education support personnel around the world. It's around 400 organizations and like 32 million um, professionals that we represent. and. Um, we are working closely together with IFLA at the global level, but of course also we have been working with um, regional library bodies um, and uh, librarians, um, the national level, um, yeah, together with IFLA on, on different projects in the context of WIPO, um, kind of linking national debates to global debates and the other way around. And for us, really, we are engaged on copyright issues um in the context um, to promote human rights and um, for us it's the right to education the right to decent work um, um and quality research um there's a big component for us in terms of academic freedom and professional autonomy the rights of teachers to choose and adapt materials to cater for their diverse student body and of course um there's a big link to libraries as well because um our universities have university libraries, um, their school libraries, um, their collaborations with libraries to foster um, literacy. And um, I think as much as our advocacy to for better copyright laws for education and research benefits libraries, the other way around is the same. So whatever better laws we have for the library sector, we will also have a positive impact on um, on our sector. So it's a really fruitful and an important collaboration to defend um, human rights and, and the public interest and in access to knowledge. Um, our objectives at WIPO are in the long term, we um, advocate for a treaty for education and research um, that basically um, sets minimum standards um, for more equal access to um, copyright protected materials for teachers and researchers. Um, as well as um, to access to data, so for text and data mining in the research sector, and that fosters cross-border collaboration exchange, which currently is uh, very tricky to negotiate from a legal perspective. And at the moment, um, yeah, we have many countries, um, particularly in the developing countries, that pay a lot more for access to materials for education research than others. And it's really important to have this global debate um, that can spill down to the national level, just like as with the Marrakesh Treaty and, and promote um, um, access um, for the sector. And of course, in the short term now, we're in a, in a pandemic. Um, this had to have a massive impact also on the education sector and, and the research sector, um, where it's not really clear or many activities that teachers have been doing in the, in the classroom and where there maybe were laws where was allowed to read a book to a child, to have a theater play, to play a video, to um, give homework um, and copies. It's now suddenly illegal as teachers had to move online. Now it's not legal anymore to read a story from, from your home. And of course, um, laws can't be adapted overnight. And it's a, it's a long process. It's very difficult as, as we've heard already. And, Therefore, for us, it's important to uh, work on a, on a declaration that takes into consideration the emergency um, situation that um, makes sure that um, teachers and researchers can um, do their job, um, even though the laws aren't there yet. Um, and we are happy to collaborate on this as well with IFLA and um, for the library sector. So um, in terms of strategies, we do advocacy research, capacity development, global and regional and national networks, including with libraries and and if you work with in the national level context or there are reforms or you would be interested in, in um, yeah, talking to teachers or teacher unions, then please let us know and we would be happy to facilitate. So yeah, thanks again. And yeah, we look forward to our future collaboration, hopefully many successes in this area. Thanks a lot, Nikia. We are, we are really glad. Um, and um, I'm sure that we would have fruitful collaboration in the future on the regional and national scale. Um, 
So now I would like to uh, invite uh, Teresa Hackett from ESL to take the floor. Just to remind, uh, if anyone would have questions for Nikia or Teresa, you can write them in the chat or even for Stephen, of course. Teresa, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Camille, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone, um, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so I'd like to thank IFLA for the uh, invitation to, to speak at this webinar. Um, my name is Teresa Hackett. I work for an international NGO called Electronic Information for Libraries, known as IFL, and we work with library consortia in developing and transition economy countries. And our organization is a member of IFLA, and we cooperate very closely with IFLA um, and also with Education International and all our other partners um, on copyright issues and, and at WIPO as well. And so it's great to see so many of you um, attending this webinar this afternoon and the one we had this morning as well. And I encourage you all to get involved because it's a very, um, very international work. Uh, you'll meet lots of great people, great allies, people from other, other sectors, and, and it can be very rewarding. Um, when we get successes, like, for example, with the Marrakesh Treaty, which was a great success and, and something that we are continuing to build on. So, Camille, can I ask you to move over to the next slide, please? So I'm going to talk to you um, about a new project on contributing to public interest copyright policy at WIPO. And it is, it is an opportunity to, to get further involved in, in WIPO work. And this is a new project started in January. It will run for three years. It's been managed by the Programme on Information Justice and IP, known as PIGIP, at the American University Washington College of Law. Um, the, pro the project has two parts. There's a research part and an advocacy part. In the research part, there's a network of copyright academics and, and copyright experts who will conduct high impact research on topics related to access to knowledge and access to education and the right to research and so on. And then this research will help to develop some policy proposals for, uh, for use at WIPO and also for, for uh, use in copyright reforms and including provisions and policies relating to preservation and the cross-border sharing of research materials. And then this research material and data will be used to inform our strategy on advocacy. And on the advocacy side, we will be, we are um, building a coalition of civil society advocates and network at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. The civil society coalition will consist of a broad uh, group of stakeholders, including researchers, educators, teachers, librarians, archivists, and museums, and digital rights activists as well. And we will be working to raise awareness of the public interest in copyright issues in organizing stakeholder education and very importantly supporting policymakers in your countries and with with um, with advice and information about the library and the education perspective on copyright issues providing technical assistance and engaging in any copyright reforms and we also um, would will will seek to build the next generation of library copyright advocates as well. Um, so next slide, uh, Camille, please. And to get involved, um, we have uh, organized into um, a, a series of regional leads, which you might see more or less mirror those regional groups of member states that Camille mentioned earlier. So we have a regional group for Africa, Asia and the Pacific, EU, Latin America and the, the US. And um, we encourage you to contact your regional leads for your particular, uh, for your region. And if your region is not there or if there's any other questions, Camille and Ifla will be, will be glad to any, answer any questions. So this project is just getting off the ground. So we're just building, um, you know, building the, our, our structure and building the advocacy networks at the moment. And we hope that you'll hear a lot more about it later on. So thanks very much for the opportunity.
Thank you, thank you very much, Teresa. Um, so uh, I will um, now uh, hand over to uh, Stephen for the next step. Thank you, and um, I will keep this short because we, we want to leave a bit of time for questions and answers at the end. But I think just to start, I, I wanted to echo the point that Teresa made that this is work that is international and regional and national and even local. And um, this is something that's true across the library advocacy work in general. We have this incredible power, this incredible legitimacy from the fact that we have two and a half million institutions around the world. There are millions of librarians out there every day helping people, making a difference, helping people research, learn, find work, simply participate in cultural life. And so really our arguments at WIPO are strong because they are reflecting the work that you, that our members, that libraries on the ground are doing. And as you've hopefully heard throughout this, this session, as you've heard throughout this session, in parallel, the work that we try and do at WIPO hopefully facilitates your own efforts at national level and in due course, hopefully will lead to some sort of international action that can make a difference, that can trigger reforms, that can help you get the changes that you need to be able to do your jobs. So to move on to the next slide, um, in terms of practical steps in the short term, um, in the email we'll send out to all those who've registered for these sessions, we will share links to our guide to WIPO. So you'll have the recording of this session, but also our short guide explaining what it is, how you can get involved. This will include information about how you can find out more about your own copyright laws. And of course, we suggest that you should engage your association's copyright committee if this exists. And if you don't have one, create one. We're happy to work with you on this. Um, we have a network, we've set up a mailing list. So we will encourage you all to join this. And we will use this to provide information about upcoming WIPO meetings, about the issues that are discussed, about the possibilities for you to get involved. And of course, I should note that in IFL partner countries, there is also direct support from IFL's libraries and copyright program. Um, another step that you can usefully take is trying to identify who are the decision makers? Who are the people who are responsible for your government's position? Find out their names, find out how you can get in touch with them, how you can get to know them, how they, you can encourage them to treat you as a partner. Clearly also, we will encourage you to work with other organizations that are interested in how to, that are interested in these issues. So not least the members of education, the affiliates of Education International, those education unions, Wikimedia chapters, other organizations on the ground. And of course, um, we hope that you will be ready to engage, you will be ready to, to, to get involved. And there will be many ways to do this from simply sending letters to, providing evidence, to providing ideas, to holding meetings, to mobilizing people in order to strengthen that message in favor of libraries. So the next step, next slide. Um, in terms of our own immediate next steps, what we will do is in the run up to different meetings, we will, provide, we will prepare tools to support engagement. This could be templates, this could be briefings, this could be talking points for meetings that you hold with your copyright offices. We will follow up and organize regional discussions in coordination with the leaders of regions in the Arcadia project. We will also promote regional discussions with these ally organizations, with education organizations, user rights organizations, research organizations, so you can build your networks, find allies, people you can work with. We'll of course provide regular updates. And from time to time, we'll also be keen to hear from you what's happening, what are the situations that you are experiencing where copyright is preventing you from doing what you need to do, where it's preventing you from fulfilling your mission? Are there times where you can't provide a copy of a book that a researcher needs because of copyright? Are there situations where you can't send something digitally because of copyright? Are there situations where you're simply, you're not able to preserve works that you can't take that permanent, so you can't take that safe copy of a work for the future because of copyright. So we will certainly follow up on all these things, but now, and if we move to the next slide, we it would be great to actually hear from you. So looking at the question, so we've already had um, 
so we, okay, we've had a question from Namutenya Hamwala, uh, Hama, Hamwala, and that's been answered by Teresa directly. Um, and of course, IFLA also, is, as, uh, as a member country as well, we're of course also ready to help out in, in Namibia and coordinating obviously with IFL. I think I saw a hand up. So if you would like to ask a question, we, we, we would like to recommend to use the chat. I I can see I can see um so I've seen that Harlow has asked about the Arcadia project. I, I would refer you back to Teresa's slides on that as, as she talks about this one. I don't know if Teresa you want to say anything else. Sure. Um, can you just just clarify what's the question? I don't see a it's, question. question. What is the Arcadia project? Oh, what is the Arcadia project? Oh, the Arcadia project is basically the project that I described earlier. The 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 copyright um, contributing to copyright public interest copyright policy at WIPO. So that is that project that's managed by the um, uh, American University Washington College of Law is funded by the Arcadia Foundation, and it's known commonly as the Arcadia project and um, it's to in to uh, with these two parts the research part and the advocacy part um, so that's that's what it is thank, thank you very much Teresa I've, uh, I, I can see in the chat there is another question um, from Dominga Abud how can National Library Association be engaged so I, I think what we'd recommend on that is is work out if you are willing to be the the if you're willing to be the contact on um on this then we will add you to the if a wipo mailing list and so that way we can provide regular information we can certainly invite you along to the future meetings at the regional level so that you can learn more so that you can get to know other people who are working on these issues to share ideas um and of course please do be in contact directly if you're, in a, if you're in an IFL partner country with IFL and us, otherwise just with IFLA, and then we're more than happy to, to, to help you out, to give you some pointers on how you can start getting involved in this as an issue. Thank you for your answer. Is there, um, so we have an, another question from Manuela Barreto Nunes. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, in public libraries, we have particular difficulties with copyright for digital storytelling because we have to ask to special permission and sometimes the authors are not that easy to find. Are you recommending anything special about this? I'm representing BAD, the Portuguese Library and, and Archivist Professional Association. So we are conscious that this has been an issue in many countries. Um, now there's this, two approaches to this and um, clearly one way which we certainly recommend trying out is trying to get hold of local publishers and showing them that there have been some really positive examples from Ireland, from New Zealand, from Australia, countries where the local publishers association has talked to the local libraries because publishers also know it doesn't, it's not good public relations to deny to stop libraries carrying out digital story times. In some countries, following pressure from libraries, this is the case of Canada, publishers have agreed, okay, we're going to let you do this. In some countries where copyright law is sufficiently flexible, like the United States, arguably you don't need permission. So first step is try to reach out to the publishers, promote this as a good news story. This is a really good thing for them to be able to talk about. It's story times for children. This, this should be an easy thing to do. Um, if you're not getting anywhere, um, certainly just take relevant precautions. Don't put things up on YouTube. Uh, probably you may be able to do things through secure networks and that may be just about acceptable, but best thing to do is to reach out to publishers first. If you're not in a country like the US where there is that possibility to, to do things under an exception. 
Thank you. Is there um, any additional question for the panelists? Well, I think we have a few minutes left. If anyone wants to write something, they still have a bit of time. I, I think just to respond to Melissa's comment, I, that's exactly what we will look to do in the follow up to this call is give ideas on what are the opportunities, what can help at what time, because I know, yes, okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa, I can see you've sort of followed up on that. Um, what we will do is we will put out information on a regular basis on how to actually get involved on what opportunities there are. As I said, key elements are going to be likely to, to reach out to national copyright offices, to reach out to policymakers and make sure they understand what it is that libraries can do to help, that they understand what that they understand the position of libraries and that they have no excuse for saying things that go against the interests of libraries. Another key thing will be evidence. It will be being able to tell stories of the experience you've had, of the challenges you've encountered, of the, the ways in which inadequate copyright laws are preventing you from achieving your missions. So that those are the two big categories, but we would provide further information. We didn't want to give you too much of a task list on a webinar. Thanks. Um, I see that Ayo Yorker is uh, asking how many participants uh, the webinar had this morning and this afternoon. Um, I think someone can answer or it's I can. It's about, about uh, over 30 each time which is, yeah. Okay, I think I think uh, if we don't have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading in the same time. Yes, sorry, Teresa, I see your message in the same time. But otherwise, if, um, is, if there is no additional questions, well, thank you for subscribing to, to the mailing list. Uh, I see that in the comments, that's, that's really welcome. Um, Otherwise, I think we can close our webinar today. So before to close, I would like to thank well, all the panelists and especially Teresa Hackett and Nicola uh, Warter for, for joining uh, us today and to discuss this very important topic. And to all attendees for joining us, I think this is really important and we are delighted to be able to, to engage this work with you. Uh, so we will be shortly in touch. We will share like um, an email with uh, all the necessary information very soon. Um, we, as you mentioned, um, uh, we have made a recording of this webinar, so we will be able to share it as well um, for colleagues that have not been able to attend. And otherwise, I thank you all again, and I wish you a very good uh, day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.